Good morning, I'm Kenneth Moten. And I'm Janae Norman. Here are the top five things to know this Thursday. Number one, the war of words at the White House. President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi are accusing each other of having a meltdown after an explosive meeting about the crisis in Syria. Pelosi walked out of that meeting offended after the president allegedly called her a third-rate politician. Number two, the impeachment battle. The U.S. ambassador to the European Union is testifying today in the impeachment inquiry. Gordon Sondland is the diplomat who texted about there being no quid pro quo as President Trump withheld aid to Ukraine. But he's expected to say those were the president's words, not his. Number three, Chicago public school teachers are heading to the picket lines after failing to reach a new contract deal. Classes are canceled today for nearly 400,000 students in the nation's third largest school district. In addition to pay increases, teachers want smaller class sizes and more time to prepare for lessons. Meanwhile, GM workers could soon be heading back to work after more than 30 days on strike. The union maker and the automaker and union leaders have reached a tentative deal. Number four, former TV host Megyn Kelly is calling for an independent investigation to the sexual misconduct allegations against Matt Lauer. In a Fox News interview, Kelly criticized NBC, saying they haven't detailed the sexual harassment settlements related to Lauer. Kelly said if they have nothing to hide, there should be more transparency. Show us all of the agreements, the enhanced severance agreements that were reached, or at least the numbers, so we can see which ones pop out, which ones are super high. Release the women from their confidentiality obligations. There needs to be an outside investigation into this company. They investigated themselves. That doesn't work. No. Fox News had an outside investigator. CBS News had an outside investigator. NPR, the NFL, this is how it's done. It was Kelly's first interview since her abrupt departure from NBC last year and her first appearance on Fox News since leaving the cable news channel three years ago. And finally, number five, the crimes against cheese in California. Police say two men stole $50,000 worth of cheese from the food plant where they worked near Fresno. Apparently, the pair have been taking the merchandise for two years, then selling it on social media at flea markets and door-to-door. -door. Police recovered what they say was large amounts of the stolen product. Mm. Good morning, everyone. We begin with President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi trading jabs after that explosive meeting at the White House. Pelosi walked out of the meeting about the crisis in Syria, saying the president had a meltdown, but the president claims it was the other way around, tweeting this photo and calling the speaker unhinged. But without missing a beat, Pelosi trolled him back, using the picture for her Twitter background. She said the president was shaken after so many House Republicans voted to oppose his decision to abandon America's Kurdish allies. ABC's Elizabeth Hur joins us now with the latest. Elizabeth, good morning. Janae and Kenneth, Vice President Mike Pence has traveled to Turkey hoping to work out a peace deal. Meanwhile, in Washington, yes, we are getting two very different versions of what happened inside that meeting on Syria. President Trump standing by his decision, pulling U.S. troops out of Syria. Turkey is taking land from Syria. Syria is not happy about it. Let them work it out. The president also tweeting pictures from a White House meeting on Syria. In one tweet writing, do you think they like me? Referring to top Democrats who sat stone-faced before walking out of that meeting. He was insulting, particularly to the speaker. She kept her cool completely, but he called her a third-rate politician. And Go ahead, Stanley. What we witnessed on the part of the yeah. president was a meltdown. Sad to say. Pelosi later making one of the pictures Trump tweeted her new Twitter cover photo and claiming the president was shaken by this earlier vote in the House. On this vote, the yeas are 354, the nays are 60. House Democrats and Republicans voting overwhelmingly to condemn the president's withdrawal of American forces from northern Syria, a move that cleared the way for a planned Turkish assault on Kurdish forces, a decision facing mounting backlash even from one of Trump's closest allies, Senator Lindsey Graham on CNN. He will have American blood on his hands if he abandons Kurds because ISIS will come back. No, Lindsey Graham would like to stay in the Middle East for the next thousand years. Late Wednesday, the White House released this letter President Trump wrote to the president of Turkey, which read in part, let's work out a good deal. You don't want to be responsible for slaughtering thousands of people, and I don't want to be responsible for destroying the Turkish economy, and I will. History will look upon you forever as the devil if good things don't happen. Don't be a tough guy. Don't be a fool. 
Well, as for that White House meeting on Syria, White House officials maintained the president was measured, factual and decisive, and that Speaker Pelosi walking out was baffling but not surprising. Kenneth? All right, Elizabeth Herr, thank you. And breaking news just in, Maryland Congressman Elijah Cummings has died. A brief statement from his office says Cummings passed away overnight at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore due to long-standing health challenges. Cummings did not return to his office as expected this week following a medical procedure. He was the powerful chairman of the House Oversight and Reform Committee leading the impeachment inquiry of President Trump. Cummings was elected to Congress in 1996. Cummings is survived by a wife and three children. He was 68 years old. Now to the impeachment showdown with lawmakers poised to hear from another official embroiled in the Ukraine scandal. The U.S. ambassador to the European Union is heading to Capitol Hill today despite an attack by the White House to block his testimony. And we're getting new details about why a former aide sounded the alarm about his conduct. This morning, a key figure in the impeachment inquiry preparing to testify. The ambassador to the European Union, Gordon Sondland, will appear before three House committees. And now ABC News has learned the president's former top Russia advisor, Fiona Hill, believed Sondland was a potential national security risk because of his inexperience. Sondland is a Trump mega donor with no diplomatic experience. Hill told House investigators during her testimony that she was concerned about Sondland's self phone use, according to ABC's Mary Bruce. Now, Hill said that he would frequently use his personal cell phone for diplomatic affairs, potentially leaving him vulnerable, and reportedly took it upon himself to invite foreign officials to the White House. David Hill was so concerned that she reportedly raised this issue with White House intelligence officials. Sondland has defended the president against accusations that Trump was withholding military aid to Ukraine until the Ukrainians agreed to investigate Joe Biden and his son. In text messages, already turned over to House investigators. America's top diplomat in Ukraine, Bill Taylor, writes, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with the political campaign. Sondland responds, the president has been crystal clear, no quid pro quos of any kind. According to the Washington Post, Sondland is expected to tell Congress today that that response was essentially dictated by the president. Trump has cited Ambassador Sondland's text to clear himself. The text message that I saw from Ambassador Sutherland, who's highly respected, was there's no quid pro quo. He said that. Sondland was expected to testify last week when he agreed to appear without a subpoena, but the White House blocked that appearance. The families of two Americans detained in China say the charges against them are bogus. Alyssa Peterson and Jacob Harlan run a company that connects Americans who want to teach English with Chinese schools. They are accused of illegally moving people across borders. Their families are concerned that detentions could turn into a lengthy ordeal because of diplomatic trade tensions between China and the U.S. Crews at the scene of last weekend's deadly building collapse in New Orleans have moved from rescue into recovery mode. Officials say all indications are the one worker still unaccounted for did not survive. One body was pulled from the rubble Sunday. Another has been located but not removed. Investigators say no signs of life have been detected in the debris. Well, this morning we're hearing from heroic high school students who jumped a classmate who brought a gun to school. La Habra High School, just outside Los Angeles, was placed on lockdown Tuesday. Police say a 14-year-old freshman brought a handgun to campus to either show it off or to try to sell it. Fellow students took matters into their own hands when they saw the gun. I grabbed him by his legs and I pulled him down. About three other of my friends came and hopped on top of him to try to hold him stable. And by then, he was kind of flipped around and he said, grab his gun. And I was like, that's, that's when I knew for sure he had a gun. Police say the gun was not loaded. The student was taken into custody. No word on whether he faces any charges. Birmingham's police chief is making an urgent and passionate plea for help in locating a missing three-year-old girl. The chief is asking for any information or video that could help bring Camille Cupcake McKinney home. Police say she was kidnapped Saturday night during a birthday party. Investigators searched an apartment complex for three hours on Wednesday after receiving a tip, but found no signs of the toddler. If you know where Camille is, that you contact us, that you please bring her to a safe location, and we will follow up from there. We need your help. We believe that you know where she is, and we believe that someone has her. 
Camille's family is also begging for the girl's return. Detectives interviewed two persons of interest. They were charged on unrelated counts. Rewards totaling $25,000 are being offered. A Nebraska man who spent 24 hours trapped in a sewer is expected to be okay. Fire crews in Lincoln rescued him Tuesday evening. They say he'd been trapped without food or drinkable water. When someone heard him screaming for help, crews found him in a four-foot wide pipe. Police are not sure how he got there. They say he had a backpack and a bicycle with him. In Florida, the search is on to find two women accused of drugging and robbing a 69-year-old tourist from the Cayman Islands. They approached the victim while playing poker, and they were caught on camera slipping something into the man's drink at the Hard Rock Casino. Police say the two women stole $1,000 and a Rolex worth approximately $15,000. Now is your chance to buy some of celebrity chef Anthony Bourdain's prized possessions. Bourdain's estate is auctioning his art, furniture, and other items. Highest bid so far is $21,000 on custom steel and meteorite chef's knives. Uh, proceeds will go to a culinary scholarship as well as his daughter and his estranged wife. The online auction is open until October 30th. Well, coming up, how you could be the face of the robot revolution. What one tech firm wants to do to help the elderly. But first, we go to Pakistan, where the royal couple is doing more than fashion diplomacy after this. An officer with the Utah Highway Patrol says he's still trying to process what many are calling a heroic rescue. The patrolman risked his life to save an unconscious man from an oncoming train with just seconds to spare. ABC's Will Carr has the details. A life saved with seconds to spare. Yeah, Utah State Trooper Ruben Correa racing up that embankment. He was making a traffic stop when the call came in for a car stuck on the tracks. The driver unconscious. The train's headlights racing towards the car. He wasn't responding and then I heard the, the horn from the train. Correa believes the collision threw the car 30 feet down the tracks. It was within a second of that collision so maybe just a second later and, and it would have been a different outcome. Had I been going the full 80 miles an hour, if I'd hit, hit the brake uh, even a few seconds later, this would have had a very different outcome for sure. That trooper being called a hero. That driver suffered an unknown medical condition at the time. The trooper says that he had no time to think he was just doing his job. In Los Angeles, Will Carr, ABC News. Thank you, Will. Now to Pakistan, where Prince William has been following in the footsteps of his mother, Princess Diana. Prince William and Duchess Kate using the opportunity to talk about issues close to their hearts, including climate change and water scarcity. Our foreign correspondent, Maggie Ruley, has been following along with the royal couple and joins us now from Lahore. Maggie, good morning. Hey, Janae and Kenneth, how's it going? It's been such an awesome week here in Pakistan. We've been with the royal couple. You mentioned some of those uh, great things they've been doing. You know, Will and Kate said when they came here for this royal tour, they wanted to show kind of the Pakistan of today, saying it's a vibrant nation, it's a dynamic nation, it's forward thinking. So we've been seeing them in all these colorful dresses, attending cultural events, really embracing the people here. Oh, where we are right now, we're at a cricket game. I learned that. I thought it was a match. I was corrected by, uh, you know, the, the British and smart people among us. Um, and they're here today because, you know, they wanted to really be involved in Pakistani culture. That's they wanted to meet as many people here on the ground as possible. And we always know Kate kind of gets sporty as well. So uh, they're going to be playing with kids here later. I don't know how um, caught up you guys are on, on cricket. Uh, how much do you know about the game? I know a little bit about cricket. I've actually gone to a game before. Do you? I, I know speaking, nothing. Maggie. And speaking of the vibrant up and uh, just incredible, Maggie Ruley, you are vibrant covering the and Royals. And living your best life over there. What's it there? like covering? Um, and what's been your favorite part? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You mentioned living my best life. I want to show you guys a, a recent purchase I made. Um, this we bought last night in Islamabad. Isn't it beautiful? Let me put it on so I can, you know, properly finish speaking to you today. I'm going to ruin my mic. I apologize in advance. But it's worth it because it's so fabulous. Oh, that, that is, is beautiful. It's an example of how vibrant. Isn't it nice? I know. Yeah, I'm just waiting for you to send. Here. I'm waiting for you to send back uh, one of those presents back here to the States um, yeah, after you we left like us. gifts, Maggie. Oh, I should do that. You know the address. I? Okay, don't worry. <laughs> Across the pond. So, I'll be Maggie, what else is on tap for the Royals, uh, at least today? 
Yeah, well, it's a big day. You know, and it's not all sort of about <laughs> beautiful, vibrant dresses. Uh, it's a big day. We're going to see Kate really stepping out today. Uh, she's uh, spoken about children. This is a, a huge message for her. We've seen the royals really latching on to these big messages and moments, tackling serious issues. Because while you know they're promoting Pakistan as a dynamic nation, there's obviously some serious issues here as well. So they've been focusing on security, on climate change, big issue for the royals, on women, women's education and children. Uh, today, more of that. But also today, something uh, that we're following is this connection to Princess Diana. You know, we saw Harry do this on the last tour uh, in, in Africa as well. And William and Kate are doing it today. They're visiting a hospital that Princess Diana went to just over 20 years ago. Uh, Pakistan was a really special place for Diana. She visited here three times in the 90s, helped raise money for a cancer hospital uh, here in town where we are right now. And so uh, Will and Kate are, are, are going to be there. Uh, and the palace has sort of made that connection, saying it's a chance for, uh, for William and Kate to continue on his mother's legacy. So some touching moments today as well as the couples, you know, also focusing on these serious issues. Mom would be proud. Yeah. Well, Maggie, thank you so much mm -hmm. for joining us. And we're proud of you too, Maggie, really. <laughs> Have fun. Of course. Good to see you all. <laughs> all right. Bye, let's guys. check our notifications now. Starting with the sculpture of British Prime Minister Boris Johnson made out of butter. 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 Right there. Butter. Yeah. Um, it's just there. Just Boris and butter. There you go. No butter knives. Butter Boris. Don't spread this. Uh, next to uh, Hungry Bear diving in a dumpster for dinner in Connecticut. It's behind a sushi restaurant. The bear smelled fish and said, I want it. I want it. Where is it? In the meantime, we have an update on Jennifer's new foray in the world of Instagram. That's Aniston. That Jennifer. Poking fun about how she temporarily crashed the site on Tuesday with her friend's reunion snap. She posted a funny clip from the first episode of her new show, The Morning Show. Yeah, just two posts in. She's already self-promoting, clearly. She's already mastered the gram, The Morning Show. It's going to be on Apple TV. She's making $2 million per episode. Her and Reese Witherspoon. She and Reese bunch. doing it big. Yeah. She shadowed at GMA just a few Saw the craziness. Over the summer. Mm -hmm. Next to life imitating art. But unfortunately for one fan of the movie Superbad, what started out as a hilarious and fictional scene wound up getting him arrested. So let's refresh your, your memory. Yeah. Hawaii. Mm -hmm. All right, that's, that's good. It's hard to trace, I guess. Wait, you, you changed your name to McLovin? <laughs> McLovin? What kind of a stupid name is that, Fogel? What, are you trying to be an Irish R&B singer? Oh, they, they let you pick any name you want when you get down there. And you landed on McLovin? Yeah, I was between that and Muhammad. McLovin, it. <laughs> uh, well, 20-year-old Daniel Burleson from Iowa was approached by police at a bar when they suspected he was drinking underage. They spotted a fake ID in his wallet, an exact replica of the McLovin ID How from the movie. How did he get in with that? He was charged with drinking underage and possession of a fake ID. Seth Rogen's response, my work here is done. Well, get him out of jail, Seth. Yeah. <laughs> well, he probably didn't go to jail. Just got probably got like a citation or something. Take it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Take it. Uh, now is your chance to cash in on the opportunity to be the face of new line of robots. An anonymous tech firm is looking for the right person to lend their looks to robot assistance for the elderly. If you have a kind and friendly face, mm -hmm. it will be recreated on thousands of so-called virtual friends. Oh, you don't say. The person with the winning look will earn about $130,000. Oh. Those robots are scheduled to that. come out next year. And so that's our question of the day. Yeah, would you want your face on an army of robots? What about $130,000? Could you use that? Tell us in the comments or tweet us at ABC News Live. It was exactly 30 years ago today that one of the deadliest earthquakes in U.S. history rocked Northern California. The magnitude 6.9 quake killed dozens, injured thousands, and caused billions of dollars in damage. Will Gans has the sights and sounds of that day, plus what's happening today. Will, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, it was game three of the World Series. The Oakland A's taking on the Giants at home in San Francisco. Thousands there in the stadium and millions more watching at home. When one of the worst earthquakes in California and the United States' history struck. We interrupt our regular program schedule to bring you a special report from ABC News. I'm Ted Koppel. There has been a rather strong earthquake in Northern California. October 17th, 1989. California's central coast rocked by a 6.9 magnitude earthquake just after 5 p.m. It's a frightening feeling and up above us the lights are starting to shake a bit. We don't know what's happening outside the studio at this time. The damage devastating. 
You can see the fire down past me. Uh, what has happened is that the natural gas lines have ruptured, and that is what has caused that fire. The water lines have ruptured. There is no water coming out of the fire hydrants. Buildings burning in San Francisco, others collapsing just like they did in Santa Cruz. Debris killing three people there. A section of the San Fran Oakland Bay Bridge collapsing. Two cars that were on the upper deck when the bridge collapsed, they fell below. And in West Oakland, 42 people losing their lives when a double deck section of Interstate 880 crumbled. President George H.W. Bush surveying the devastation caused by what would forever be called the Loma Prieta earthquake. Sad in some ways, and yet uh, genuine appreciation for the way this community is pulling together. In all, 63 people were killed and another 3,700 injured. Experts saying that number would have been much worse had it not been for the World Series game being played in San Francisco. The Giants taking on the Oakland Athletics, which meant at the time fans were more likely off of those bridges and roads that collapsed. 30 years later, that part of the Bay Bridge has been completely replaced. The damaged freeways and buildings rebuilt. And today, 16.4 million people are set to take part in the Great Shakeout Earthquake Drill, the largest in history. Also this afternoon, earthquake early warning alerts will become publicly available throughout all of California, marking the nation's first statewide quake warning system. The early earthquake cell phone warnings will function the same way as the wireless notification system that issues Amber Alerts, which should come in handy there. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, coming up, we've got to look ahead at what's going on this Thursday. Plus a milestone for the last real life Rosie the Riveter when we come back. Here's what to watch out for today. President Trump travels to Fort Worth, Texas to participate in a roundtable and fundraiser with supporters before taking a tour of the Louis Vuitton workshop in Alvarado and holding a campaign rally in Dallas. The U.S. Ambassador to the European Union, Gordon Sondland, faces a deposition by three congressional panels in the Trump impeachment probe. According to the Washington Post, Sondland is expected to tell Congress today that his text message to America's top diplomat in Ukraine, saying the president has been crystal clear, no quid pro quos of any kind, was essentially dictated by the president. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg says he will live stream a speech he's giving on his views on voice and free expression. He says it's the most comprehensive take he's written about his views and how we might address the challenges that more voice and the internet address and the major threats to free expression around the world. You can watch the speech right here on ABC News Live at 1 o'clock Eastern. Chicago's 25,000 teachers have authorized a strike against the public school system, demanding more funding to ease overcrowded classrooms and a lack of support staff. And 16.4 million people are expected to participate in the largest ever Great Shakeout earthquake drill. 30 years to the day after one of the deadliest earthquakes in U.S. history rocked Northern California. Plus, don't forget to tune into the debrief for an update on all our top stories in the briefing room for a breakdown of the latest headlines in politics. Well, finally, this morning, the woman who personified the modern labor movement as the last Rosie the Riveter is about to hit a milestone. Eleanor Otto is about to turn 100 years old later this month on October 28th. But friends and family are already gathering in her home in Long Beach, California, to celebrate. Otto joined the war effort in 1942, working as a riveter at the Roar Aircraft Corporation. Over the years, the company was taken over by Boeing, which shut the plant down five years ago. Um, and get this, Otto was still working as a riveter at age 95 when the plant closed. Incredible. Her secret to long life, keep your sense of humor. Oh, Amen. Yeah. Uh, that'd, hats off. That'll get to you through her. a lot as well. Yeah. Well, that's it from us today. Please have a great day. Tomorrow's Friday. We'll see you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.